Suzanne Perrin. I'm going to introduce Japanese textiles from my collection. So we're going to look at some children's kimono to begin with. This is a lovely girl's, young girl's kimono from about the 1930s. It's got quite long sleeves. It's made of crepe silk, very fine, very soft. And it is a Yuzen design of flowers of the four seasons and is um, Yuzen is hand painted and then blocked so that the different sections are dyed at different times. It's long sleeves here and it's got a red interior like this inside which was quite normal and it has the long ties at the front, the long ribbons at the front which would be tied around the body of the mother when they were taking the child to the shrines for their blessings. This usually happened when the children were 753, Sichigo-san, and they would be taken to the shrines and temples. This is a very nice kimono, very soft colours for a girl. This is a boy's kimono here. This is a formal kimono, and we know this because it's black, and also it has the family crests on it. So three at the back, as you can see here, and then two at the front, like this. So there's five crests all together. This is made of Rinzu satin silk. It's very smooth, very fine silk. And it has beautiful crane on the back. In fact, it has about seven cranes on this whole garment. It's very beautiful. And the crane is symbolic of flying up into heaven and is usually counterbalanced by the turtle diving down into the ocean. Turtles are symbolically represented by the hexagon from the turtle shell. And in this one, the turtle shells and hexagons all have symbolic meanings inside them. So there's pine trees, rattles, auspicious and lucky symbols to help the boy along on his days uh, going to the shrines on the 753 festivals. This also has the long ties at the front, so it's also an Omiya Mairi. These would be, as I said, wrapped around to help carry the child to and from the shrines. So we have one of my favourites is here. This is also a formal kimono for a boy, a bit of an older boy, I think. This one is also, it's very similar to the last one. It's Rinzu satin silk, quite heavy silk, this one. It has the family crests, the carmon at the back, as we saw, we have three at the back and then two at the front. It also has the beautiful long ribbon ties so that it's going around the body of the mother. This one is a magnificent one, it's hand painted in the manner of Chinese ink paintings. It has the most beautiful tiger on the back and the tiger is stalking in the bamboo grove and is a very powerful symbol indeed for this particular boy. It's got mountains and bamboo and all sorts of things that are painted onto it and it's got gold as well, gold painted onto it. There is a secret to this particular tiger and if I can show you, the tiger is shown here with um, its tail coming around here and then it has another tail on the sleeve. So in fact it has two tails, one on the sleeve and one on the front side of the kimono. So it's a, an intriguing idea and maybe there's a story behind it. The tiger with two tails. It's a beautiful example of hand painting on silk, which believe me is quite difficult to do, having tried it when I was in Japan. This is another boy's kimono, a baby boy, and this one is about 1930s as well. It has a very colourful aspect to it, short sleeves, little sleeves, and is very gay in its colouring, blues, greens, has lots of auspicious symbols. It's got cranes and hexagons for turtles, of course, and also has the koi carp, very significant for boys in Japan. Koi carp are used on the 5th of May uh, when it's the boys' day, boys' festival. So there will be carp streamers floating around and um, carp are very associated with boys. So this is a very nice little kimono. It's printed, 
It's a mixture of silk and cotton, um, and the interior is cotton, which is very nice, very cool for the summer. So this would be a summer kimono. It's very light and cool to wear, and has these very nice auspicious symbols, and still with the long ties at the front to be taken to the shrines. So this is uh, a few of these children's kimono for the moment. And this, um, moving on to some other pieces now to show you, uh, this is looking at other forms of silk. <clears throat> this is a section, it's a sleeve in fact, from an uchkake, which is a wedding gown, a full wedding gown. This is just a sleeve, which would be like this. It's um, machine made silk. Now you can see it inside, it's a new piece uh, from Nishijin in Kyoto, which is where they make the brocade for these wonderful garments. This is uh, quite typical, very bright colours, of a crane. There are several cranes, or would have been several cranes on this whole garment. Cranes make for life, so of course it's a very good symbol to have on your wedding gown. And as you can see immediately in the background, there are the hexagons symbolising the turtle as well, crane and turtles, and there are plum blossoms as well for spring fertility rejuvenation. So this is um, a lovely piece, it's new of course, um, but this is just one sleeve of the whole garment. So you can imagine the gorgeousness of that wedding gown worn on your wedding day. This is another new piece of Nishijin Ori, as they call it. Nishijin is the area in um, northwestern Kyoto where they make the brocades, where they're the weaving, dyeing, producing area um, in Kyoto. This is um, a new piece, it was still in its cellophane, of brocade, showing roundels and chrysanthemums in pale and orange gold, white and silver. And this is the sort of piece that would be used for an obi sash like this and you would put it around the actual sash itself is very thick very long it's but about 14 foot long and then is wrapped around and then tied at the back in different ways so it's quite a big piece of material there's another sample here from nishijin ori the brocade this is also from kyoto in one of the markets you can see that's the back side there of the weaving um, again, it's chrysanthemums and hexagons inside on a hexagon ground in various colours with gold. Very beautiful. This is again typically what you would use and wear for your <coughs> obi sash going right around the middle here. So this is quite typical of that kind of fabric, all machine made these days of course. Another <coughs> piece here which is actually not a sash, though it looks like it, is this piece. It's actually um, a sword slip case. Sword goes in there. It's the short sword of the uh, Daisho, uh, which the samurai had. They had two swords in their belt. One was long, the katana, and the other one was a short sword. So the short sword would have been in this one here. So there's a little tag here and you would fold over the top like this over the hilt and then the cord would come in here and you would wrap the cord around to keep it very clean and safe. The pattern on this is very nice. It's woven brocade. It's fans open and half closed with water behind. The water has hexagons on it signifying turtles in the water and the, and the fans have cranes and phoenixes and flowers and blossoms um, and wheels, um, all sorts of auspicious symbols. So this is rather nice, it's in gold and a deep green blue, it's very unusual colours, it's very nice, it's a modern piece um, but it's a very nice sample of that brocade. And here we have also, one can buy these kind of packets, this is all silk this is all pure silk samples. You can do lots of patchworks. They are different patterns of dyed and printed and painted samples cut up from old things or perhaps new things. And you can easily buy these also in um, Japan, uh, a lot in Kyoto, of course, but also in other places as well. 
Now you can see I'm wearing, what I'm actually wearing today is a very nice Shibori Haori. Haori is the jacket which both men and women wear. In fact, kimono is just the generic term for clothing, ki mono, wearing thing. So we associate it with the beautiful garments that we know from Japan, but in fact it just means clothes. So this is another, very similar to the one I'm wearing, haori, uh, for a woman. And I'm showing you this because it is shibori, like this is shibori. Shibori is tie-dye. So in fact, what it means is that every little dot that you see is basically one grain of rice that's been wrapped around and then another and then another 10, 20, 50. Uh, so each spot you have to imagine the grain of rice is in there and where it's bound is the resist that takes that doesn't die. So in this particular one we've got flowers, the flower patterns as you can see on the back. So at the center of the flower is the white of the ground of this silk garment. Everything else is tie-dyed. Everything else is tie-dyed. So if I hold it close you might be able to see some of the detail in this. It's very popular, it was very popular in the first part of the 20th century but of course doing this now takes a long time so you don't really find good shibori very often and if you do it can be quite expensive. So this one that I have on is also a very nice piece from the early part of the 20th century in this kind of patterning. So shibori is tie-dyeing um, and is very well known today in Japan. Going on from the shibori tie-dye, there is another part of the textiles in Japan which are for the working class, peasants, people in the countryside and in fact they are now called country textiles is the generic term for these kinds of things. This is um, a piece, I have a couple of pieces here um, which are really table cloth centers but they show shibori. This is another kind of shibori which is um, again the grain of rice tied around and resisted to make the pattern. This is aizome, this is blue dye, blue indigo dye and it was very well known in the countryside. In fact you would get um, places, um, villages that would specialize in the dye. You had paper making villages, lacquer making villages, woodworking villages and also villages that made and dyed textiles um, outside of the capital and then would supply people in the capital as well. So this one is quite a nice pattern. Um, all the white of course is the resist and uh, this is a similar form of tie dyeing which in fact is known throughout the world. All sorts of countries have very similar products and of course the blue dye, the indigo, strengthens the cotton. Now the fabrics that the working people, the peasants used in the countryside were obviously not silks, they couldn't afford them for one thing. They, the silks were only for the very wealthy um, but they would have cotton and hemp bast fibres, plant fibres, jute, this kind of thing. This is another one. So we have, you can see the pattern forming here. It's a very nice pattern. It's simple, but very effective. And in fact, Aizome, the blue dye, um, indigo dye, actually strengthened the fabric, which is why they used it very much like denim, actually, um, strengthened the fabric for the working class and for working clothes. There's all sorts of interesting things to do with that. Um, this is another form of dyeing, although it's a different one. This is called stencil, this is katazome, this is stencil dyeing, and a particular type of stencil, this is uh, Serizawa. Serizawa was an artist, craftsman, who uh, popularized the stencil print um, in his time in the early 20th century, and he was very popular, he was a national treasure, um, there are very, some very, very interesting craftsmen. So he popularized this kind of stencil printing with bold patterns, um, clear cut patterns, clear colors, um, which were very readable and very nice. So you, you can buy things like this as well, which are part of the sort of country textiles um, area of um, textile producing craft works in Japan. This is a piece, this is actually silk. It's a rough silk. 
um, would have been used for everyday casual working kimono for people um, inside and outside. In fact, men and women could wear this. The stripe it was a very, very common pattern. You see it very much in Japanese prints. If you start looking at the details of the fabrics in Japanese prints, you will often see stripes like this. So this is a kind of slub silk. It's very fine. It's quite nice, easy to wear, cheaper to make. And this would have been made with the cocoons that were of lesser quality. So, of course, the silk cocoons, when they were spinning everything and uh, determining the quality of the um, silk, obviously the best quality went into making the very fine fabrics, and the lesser quality was sold off to make the more cheaper types of silk that were then woven and dyed for the working classes. This is something that was put together by a company actually in Australia which shows you all the different sort of little snippets snippets of patterns from different Aizome, they've got Kasuri, there's Ikat weave in there, there's some tie dyeing, there's some stripes, uh, there's all kinds of different things in there which is quite nice, that's quite a nice sort of sample sheet as it were on the different kind of textiles you can get with Aizome. I'd like to finish up with three little things as accessories, uh, which is the way they make the accessories to go with the outfits that you're wearing. Fans are very important in Japan. Everybody has a fan, especially in the summer. And this is a very nice slip case for a fan. It's um, Nishijin Brocade deep blue background with a pattern of water, although you probably can't see that, and then these diamonds with uh, diamonds with motifs of flowers and um, maple leaves inside it. It's a very, very nice pattern. would love to have a whole kimono of that one. Uh, so there's your fan case and the bags, of course, the accessories. This is a very typical traditional bag made of bamboo woven basketry as the base. That's a little basket with chiriman printed silk on top. This would be very appropriate with your red kimono going out for the day. Or my favorite is this little bag here, which is showing us a um, section of printed um, fabric in different patterns which was very popular in the Edo period 17th to 19th century dark blue stencil printed pattern in this little bag as your accessory so very nice to go out and meet people and have your little bags with your mobile phone in it or whatever thank you so much for watching thank you